Hello, it's Scott Manley here. In the last couple of weeks, SpaceX finally got the go-ahead to launch Starlink satellites with direct-to-cell phone technology on board. And while they ended up delaying this launch a couple of weeks, it does make it the perfect time for me to do the next step in my series of communication satellites. Now we're going to talk about mobile connectivity direct to consumer from space providing phone and data. And really this is the sort of original version of this really dates back to the 1970s when uh, the marine satellites started to come online. I think Marisat was the original series and that turned into Inmarsat which was set up very similar to In Intelsat. Uh, these satellites would be out in geostationary orbit and they provided service to ships. But that sort of different scale, the technology is very similar to stuff on the land. So really, the first interesting mobile uh, data, mobile connectivity service, sort of starts to appear in the late 19... Or sorry, the early 1990s is when the ideas appear and they start to launch in the late 1990s. The idea of providing direct phone service to something that a person can carry around with them dates to, well, Iridium. Iridium's a sort of original idea uh, pitched, uh, conceived at Motorola in the late 1980s. They thought they would have 77 satellites, which uh, just happens to be the atomic number of Iridium, hence the name. Uh, there was Global Star, which came along roughly around the same time. And uh, a few years later, there was another company that looked at Iridium and looked at Global Star and their plans and said, you guys are just not thinking big enough. We want to provide direct broadband internet service from low orbit using almost a thousand satellites. And this was also funded by a tech billionaire. And no, this isn't Starlink. This was a company called Teledesic, and uh, it was funded in part early on by Bill Gates. But Iridium and Global Star wouldn't start launching satellites until, you know, 1997. And before then, there was an interesting development I want to talk about. The first home internet service provided by satellites. And uh, this was a company called Direct PC, was basically part of Direct TV, and in fact, it used the same satellites. So in the mid-1990s, getting on the internet, you had a modem that would dial up over your phone line, and if you are, you know, it might get 32 kilobit connections. If you had the best modem you could get, you might get 56 kilobit, bit, and it was frankly terrible. If you were in a big city, you might be able to get on a digital subscriber line, which might get you hundreds of kilobits. But if you were in the middle of America, you know, you weren't going to have that capability for a long, long time. So satellite internet came up as an idea to provide people this high bandwidth service. Direct PC apparently offered speeds of up to 400 kilobits per second, which was pretty good compared to the modems. So the way this would work is you would browse the internet using a regular modem and it would connect via your internet service provider and your ISP would know that you had the ability to download at high bandwidth over the satellite. So when you requested stuff, it would go to the satellite service ser uh, servers. They would then get squirted up to the satellite, encrypted with a special ID that only you could uh, you decrypt them by, and then sprayed down over the whole of North America and you would decode the stuff that was yours so that you could then watch, you know, whatever you were getting, right? And this was great. I think it cost something, I think low-end plans offered something like $15 a month for 30 megabytes of download. Yes, 30 megabytes. So that's like a couple of JPEGs a day, right? But <laughs> yeah, this was a really fascinating way of doing things. Now, because this was going to a satellite that served the whole of America, yeah, the data went all over America and you had, you were sharing bandwidth with the whole of America. <laughs> they improved this a bit when the DirecTV 4S satellite came online because this, the S was for spot beams. And this enabled the transmission of data down to a number of smaller regions, spot beams, right? I think they had some like 30 beams that would cover the entire footprint, the entire service area. And that meant you could use the same frequencies in multiple regions without them conflicting because they were you know, separated by space. This was a huge advantage. You could uplink local channels to the satellite and have it go to the different regions. 
And so this was a huge step forward in terms of being able to localize the content and maximize the amount of data that you are serving from these very expensive satellites. So yeah, this would eventually evolve over time into a two-way internet system. But yeah, it is worth noting that this really early in satellite internet had this really weird asymmetrical behavior that used modet phone lines and satellites simultaneously. Okay, so now back from that, a quick diversion. Uh, Iridium, it was massively innovative for its time. See, up to that point, everyone that had been building satellite networks, they had been using geostationary satellites. They could sit out there high above the Earth, staying effectively still. They could see large portions of the surface. You could receive their signals with, you know, a dish-sized antenna that was dumb. It didn't need to move. They could just stay pointing in the same place. But... The Iridium, they wanted it to be usable from something the size of a cell phone. And we're not talking modern cell phones, we're talking 1980s brick-sized cell phones with fold-out antenna. Even then, that was a you know, miraculous level of technology. That meant that they couldn't have a satellite in geostationary orbit that would be able to receive something at the time. But the technology wasn't there. They couldn't launch a satellite you know, into such a high orbit with the power available. So they went with low Earth orbit. Not only did they choose to go with low Earth orbit satellites, which helped with latency and all that, but um, also they chose to put a lot of processing onto the satellite itself. Most of the satellites that we've talked about in this series are simple, are what we call bent pipe repeaters. They basically take data in on one frequency and spit it out at a different frequency to different antenna. Iridium, those satellites would have a lot of onboard processing because they would actually decode the data from the ground and make decisions about where to forward the data to. So the satellites were about 650 kilograms each. They were launched on a multitude of rockets. Delta II would launch them in the US, carrying five at a time. Russia would launch them on board the Proton K, carrying seven at a time. And uh, in China, they would launch them with the Long March 2C, carrying two at a time. So this was truly an international communications constellation. The hardware would have uh, seven CPUs on board to handle the various data forwarding techniques. The, there were three main antennas on the bottom that would cover like a 60, uh, sorry, 180, 120 degree arc. This would be split out into 16 different spot beams. So you would have 48 different cells underneath each satellite. These were uh, communicating at about 1.62 gigahertz. The data would come to the satellite and then it would decide where it would send that data forward. It could either send it to a ground station at a 20 to 30 gigahertz, or it could send it across one of four inter-satellite connections. So they could send it to the satellite ahead of them in the orbit, behind them in the orbit, or to either the east or west. And it could also receive data and forward it on. So they could operate as a mesh in orbit. This was amazingly uh, high tech for the time. It, it was doing all these capabilities. So there would be 66 satellites required to make the network work. That was uh, six planes with 11 satellites in each plane. Uh, but the downside is that they would only operate, uh, deliver 2.4 kilobits per second for the voice channel so that was one quarter of what even the best you know voice compression was doing or what the the common voice compression was doing 9.6 kilobits was still pretty tight but that was working for most people um so yeah each satellite could handle something like 1100 calls per satellite and so the satellites were put in orbits that were sufficiently high inclination they could fly over the poles and the intersatellite communications was incredibly important because it meant that if you were had a satellite over the pole, there was no ground station nearby, so it would have to receive the signal and then figure out how to forward it onwards to send it to either an, a ground station, which could carry it to a landline, or potentially across the globe from one satellite to another until it found an, the other subscriber on the other end of the line, possibly directly. And you know, again, this was what was needed to deliver an efficient worldwide network that Motorola was envisaging. They wanted everyone to be carrying these rather than, you know, uh, say you're having everyone on cell phones. 
<laughs> but yes, Global Star, by comparison, it was a started launching in 1998. Um, it was a bit more conservative. It was a lot more conservative. They had 48 satellites in their network. They only went up to 52 degrees inclination. They didn't have uh, any polar service. They used very simple bent pipe repeaters. They would receive at like 1.6 gigahertz and retransmit to the nearest ground station at, you know, 20, 30 uh, gigahertz. And this meant that if you had two people, you know, maybe a mile apart making satellite phone calls using Global Star, the signal would go up to the satellite. The satellite would then have to send it to a ground station. The ground station would have to say, figure out that it was send it back to that satellite and then it would then send it back down to basically your friend who might be within shouting distance really right <laughs> uh, to be fair they uh they had 9.6 kilobit downlinks for their audio which was probably better voice quality but yeah they didn't have polar service so global star also used the delta 2 for launching and they also used a Russian launch vehicle. They started out using the Ukrainian Zenit, but uh, that unfortunately suffered a failure on its very first launch uh, with the Global Star, destroying 12 satellites. And the rest of the, for the rest of the stuff they used Soyuz, which was much more reliable. And so Global Star, Iridium, they both start launching towards the end of the 1990s. They start early trials with friends and they eventually start expanding their service. And around about this time, uh, Teledesic, they start getting really talking up and looking for investors. So Teledesic, let's talk about that. They want to provide broadband internet service to any place on the world. And it was founded by a guy that had sold a telecoms company. He had some money of his own. He convinced Bill Gates to put in $5 million. And you know, $5 million is chump change for Bill Gates at the time, but it was enough to get real investors involved. They get $200 million from some Saudi prince. They get $750 million from Motorola, who had also been developing their own broadband satellite constellation named Celestri. They dropped that idea and instead became you know, signed on with Teledesic. Boeing would put in $100 million and they would become the prime contractor for developing the satellite hardware. Uh, somewhere along the line, the satellite constellation gets shrunk down from 840 to 288 satellites, making it a bit more reasonable. Motorola would replace Boeing as a prime contractor and they never got the investment money they needed, so they never ended up launching and the company ended up going under. Why? Well, as you probably know, Neither Global Star nor Iridium were able to get enough subscribers using their service, so they were unable to pay for the development and deployment contra uh, your costs of their hardware. Both of them went bankrupt and ended up negotiating their way out of it to continue existing as a service. But that meant that the investors that were looking at Teledesic realized or thought that there wasn't a market for broadband satellite internet. And so yeah, we lost a sort of 1990s version of Starlink uh, because uh, nobody was interested in satellite phones. So, uh, yeah, Teledesic would eventually go under. But, yeah, Iridium and Global Star, they would sort of come out of bankruptcy and continue to service uh, customers. At one point, I believe Iridium was more or less threatening to deorbit all its satellites. After all, you know, they couldn't leave all this space junk up there, right? Well, that meant that the U.S. government was suddenly very interested in keeping those satellites up there. After all, it was using them. But Iridium and Global Star both going bankrupt wasn't enough to kill off the prospects for future satellite uh, phone service. There are now multiple satellite phone service providers. Thuria and Inmarsat are two examples. They operate their satellites from geostationary orbit, and they actually use pretty much the same protocol. They use GOMRI, Mobile Radio Interface Standard. Uh, they, these uh, provide multiple satellite beams from each of the satellites. They provide a service that is very close to a GSM. So Thuria is out operated out of the Middle East. I believe it has like three satellites now, and they provide service over most of Eurasia. Uh, they also provide service now down in Australia. Um, Inmarsat obviously offers satellite service now around the world. It's just an offshoot of their existing marine satellite. 
And while GlobalStar, they could get away with their simple transponder system, you absolutely need to have onboard processing in these geostationary satellites. Because if you consider that a phone call going up to the satellite, down to the ground, back up to the satellite, and down to the receiver, that's four uh, steps to geostationary orbit. So that's a good half second of delay in there. That was enough that uh, it was decided that they needed to absolutely be able to route calls by the satellite because the transmission delay was so long. So both Iridium and Global Star continue to exist today and provide service. The Iridium network would actually be quite robust and continue to operate without really needing any replacements other than the ones that were spare on orbit. I mean, yeah, in the last 10 years, they have completely refreshed their satellites, upgrading them to Iridium Next so they can provide new service. Downside of the replacement from Iridium to Iridium Next is the antenna design changed, and that meant that the classic Iridium flares that we used to see are no longer emitted by the new satellites. Global Star, however, had all sorts of technical problems with their early satellites and needed to send up many replacements over the years. This is reliability has since been solved. Global Star today is probably best known for being the provider for Apple's SOS feature on the iPhone 14 and later. That's where iPhones can contact the satellite if they are beyond cell phone range and send a packet containing an emergency uh, message saying basically, I'm in need, here's my GPS coordinates. And this has been used in many situations to literally save lives. A full 85% of the Global Star network is now devoted to Apple's capabilities. And I'm, I'm understanding that Global Star will be launching more satellites to replace the ones that they, they have out there. Immediately after the launch of the SOS feature on the iPhone, Qualcomm partnered with Iridium to develop the same feature for Android handsets. But after a year of trying to sell the product, the partnership has dissolved as no Android handset manufacturers want to pay the premium for the service. And this may well be because there are a number of companies developing satellites that can talk directly to existing cell phones. Companies like Link Global or AST with their massive Blue Walker 3 satellite. But of course, now the biggest game in town is Starlink. Starlink, I mean, it literally is the biggest constellation, both by numbers and by mass. I mean, I guess in numbers, West Ford might technically beat it out, but Starlink, they are going to be doing everything. And now we're going to be seeing direct-to-cell phone capabilities tested in the coming year and possibly deployed to existing customers. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.